the book of Jonah, and always as a review, we're going to go to chapter 1, we saw Jonah's rebellion. God called him, he told God, I don't think so. So we learned from chapter 1, Jonah the prophet disobeyed God's call. What Wayne was talking about earlier, that we have to be obedient to the call of God. Well, Jonah disobeyed God's call. And then we learned that Jonah had a wrong attitude toward the will of God. We also learned jo Jonah also had a wrong attitude toward the word of God. He only loved the word of God when it was convenient, when it was comfortable. Just don't get me out of my comfort zone. And when God did that, he disobeyed. Jonah had a wrong attitude toward the Gentiles. Jonah was a patriot. He only loved his own people. And it's good to be patriotic and to love your own people. But it's also God has called us to love other people as well, other nations. Jonah became a curse instead of a blessing. If you read the story, there was a storm that, that rose up. And he lost a few things during that storm. He lost the voice of God. In other words, God wasn't speaking to him through his mouth. He was speaking to him through the storms, through the sea, through the sailors. Even unbelievers were telling him, call on your God. Maybe he'll have mercy on us so that we won't perish. Jonah also lost the power of prayer. How many know that when you're in intentional sin, God does not listen to your prayer? You have to repent first. The psalmist says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not listen. We have to repent of that. So he lost his prayer life because he didn't want to repent. He lost his testimony as well. And then Jonah, the rebel, suffers for his sins. They had to throw him in the water because in order for the storm to, to be calm. So he suffered for his own sins. And then chapter 2, we see Jonah's repentance. He started praying in his prayer. He prayed that God would help him. He also accepted God's discipline while he was there. He also trusted God's promises. He started quoting the scriptures in the belly of this huge fish. And then Jonah yielded to God's will for his life. So we're going to see whether Jonah's repentance was genuine or was it false. Because a lot of people have a parachute prayer when it comes to the things of God. In other words, an emergency real quick to God bail me out. And then when God bails them out, their life is getting back in order. Their marriage is fine. The kids are doing well. And then they forget about God. And now in chapter 3, we're going to see Jonah's restoration, the God of the second chances. And not only the second chances, but third, fourth, and fifth. How many know that God gives chances over and over and over again? And we see that with the life of Abraham. He fled to Egypt where he lied about his wife. He said, look, when we go to Egypt, the Egyptians, they're going to see how fly you are and they're going to want you. So say that you're my sister. He went there. He lied. He said, that's my sister. But God gave him another chance. Jacob lied to his own father, but God restored him and used him to build the nation of Israel. Moses killed a man and had to flee to Egypt, but God called him to be the leader of his people. And Peter denied the Lord three times, but Jesus forgave him and said, follow me. So we see that God is always giving people second and third and fourth chances because God is a God of love. But that does not mean that we can abuse the grace of God. In other words, we can't say to ourselves, I'm going to go sin so that God can forgive me. That's not the way it works. The person that thinks that way does not know about the awfulness of sin and the holiness of God. How many know that God is holy and must punish sin? He cannot look on evil, the Bible says, with approval. God would never approve of any of our sins. That's why Charles Spurgeon says God would never allow his children to sin successfully. He makes sure that you get caught. Why? Because he loves you. Uh, somebody else does it, a sinner does it, they get away with it, you try it, and you get caught. Because God does not allow his children to sin successfully. He's trying to draw you back. So we see he gives second chances. So Jonah chapter 3, starting at verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. See, he repented when he was in the belly of the fish, and God restored him, and now... The word of the Lord comes to him the second time. And you got to understand when you read the word of God and the God is not speaking you through his word, you got to examine your own heart. There's never anything wrong with the seed of God's word. There's always something wrong with the soil, with our own hearts. That's why two people can be in the same service, can hear the same message and leave their lives revolutionized and they apply and say, thank you, Lord, for speaking to me. Another one in the same service can leave and say, I heard all that before, big deal. 
and their life goes back to the same old same old, and there's no change in their life. So there's never a problem with the seed of God's word. So if you read the Bible and God doesn't speak to you, examine your heart. Why? Is there something that you need to get right that the word is not penetrating into your soul? And then verse 2, go to that great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Didn't God tell him that already in Jonah chapter 1? Notice how God's word never changes. People think that if I don't obey God, when I come to him, he's going to tell me something different. People think that God will ignore what he already spoken to them. It's the same message. In other words, chapter 2 could have been deleted if Jonah would obey in chapter 1. So chapter 2 was unnecessary, but because of his disobedience, he postponed the call of God in his life. How many know that we can procrastinate the call of God upon our lives? We can go in circles, and God is waiting for us and telling us the same thing. He never takes his gifts from us. The gifts and the calling of God are never withdrawn, it says in Romans. So here Jonah had to learn a hard lesson, and many of us have gone through those lessons. We've gone in circles, right? We've been hard-headed. We don't listen the first time. We're going to do our own thing. We go our own way, and we realize at the end that God always wins. Jonah wrestled with God. He said, I'm not going to do it, but who won this fight in the end? Go to the city of Nineveh that great city, and tell them the message I give you. And the older we get, the less time we want to waste. I don't know about you, but I don't like wasting time. All my time is accounted for, what I'm going to do, everything's scheduled. I don't like wasting time. And that's why when we were younger, I was telling my wife, when we were younger, the summer seemed like it was forever. Now you blink your eye and the summer's gone. Because more responsibility. Everything is organized. So Nineveh was founded in ancient times by Noah's great-grandson named Nimrod. How many remember Nimrod? Genesis chapter 10. A mighty hunter before the Lord. So Nimrod founded this city and four other cities around it. And the city was great. It was huge. It was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. These people were ruthless. They were mean. They were violent. They were aggressive. They would behead people and pile up their skulls in front of the city. They would torture people, and now God tells Jonah, I want you to go and tell them the message. And in verse 3, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. That's a beautiful phrase. Jonah obeyed, and that's what we want to do. We want to be obedient to whatever the word of God tells us to do. Whether you feel like it or not, blessings come through obedience. Not whether you feel like it or not. A lot of people have an emotional relationship with God. When they feel like it, they obey. When they don't feel like it, they don't obey. You need to obey the word of God whether you feel like it or not. And that's when the blessing comes. Jonah obeyed the Lord. Now, Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. So in order to go through this whole city, it took them about three days with the suburbs and all that. That's how big this city was. There was about 600,000 people living in that city. Wicked to the core. And Jonah now has to go there and tell these people a message that God has given them. He didn't want to go. We saw that in the beginning. And verse 4 tells us on the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. In other words, God was given Nineveh 40 days of grace. 40 more days and this city is going to be destroyed. Now picture him walking throughout the city. 40 days and Nineveh is going to be destroyed. Constantly. 40 days and this city is going to be destroyed. He was proclaiming the message of God. So now we see how Jonah brings revival. Verse 5 is interesting. Listen to what it says. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, all of them, from the greatest to the least, and put on sackcloth. Sackcloth looks more like a, a potato sack they, they used to put upon themselves. And, and dust all over themselves to, to a, a display of humility. Here this man comes, they don't know him at all, and he starts proclaiming this message, and immediately they believe God. Why is it that when unbelievers hear the gospel, a lot of times they get saved radical, and they do more than some people that have been in church 10, 15, 20 years? Right? Why is it that this heathen believed God immediately? They believed that word and said, you know what, we got to fast, we're going to be destroyed. And they repented immediately. 
And the Bible says in verse 6, when the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust, even the king. Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let every man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. He knew that they were violent people. Who knows? God may yet relent and will have compassion, turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. So here the king said even the cats and dogs are going to go on a fast. That's how serious it was. He made it a law. Nobody's going to eat. Because who knows whether this God is going to have mercy on us. They humble themselves before God through fasting and praying. And we see that God forgave them and brought about a revival in that whole city. The whole city got converted because of their repentance and praying and fasting. That's the way the church experiences revival through prayer and fasting. That's how you experience personal revival. Through prayer and fasting. That's why people that constantly are seeking God through prayer and fasting. Those people are never lukewarm. They're always on fire for God. They always have the word of the Lord. They're always zealous for God. You don't have to be lukewarm. You don't have to be cold as a Christian. But you have to live the life that God requires in his word. A life of prayer and fasting. So that the anointing of God can flow through you freely. You can't defeat the enemy by intellect. You can't defeat the enemy by your flesh. You can only defeat them by the power of the Holy Spirit that is only released through prayer and fasting. Fasting has been outdated in a lot of churches today, and that's why there's a lot of sin in the church, people sleeping around with one another, all this mess going on, men addicted to pornography. Why? Because when there is not an anointing of God, you have to substitute it with something else. You have to put programs and entertainment and shows because there's no anointing. you got to keep people somehow. But when the anointing of God is there and it's flowing, people are set free. And that only comes through prayer and fasting. And it's a discipline. You never have to be cold as a Christian. And us as a church, when we did that corporate fast, it was powerful. The anointing of God was so strong that some members said, look, I never sensed the presence of God that strong ever in my life. And this was a person that's been saved for 30 years. Because fasting is like the atom bomb that God has given us. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal and not physical, but mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. And when these people fasted, it moved the heart of God. Fasting needs to be implemented in your spiritual life. If you're struggling with a particular sin, you have a son or a daughter who's grown that's not serving God, you need to pray and fast for them. I know we have a fasting schedule that people signed up Monday through Friday, but a lot of times people forget about that. They go back to the same old lifestyle. They get cold again. And one time they asked Jesus, why do the disciples of John the Baptist and of the Pharisees fast often? But your disciples, not for nothing, I always see them eating and drinking. What's going on with that, Jesus? Why do the disciples of John fast and the Pharisees? But every time I look over, Matthew has a can of soda in his mouth. <laughs> this guy's always eating. Why is that? And look at what he told him. Can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. And then they will fast in those days. Get that in your spirit. Then they will fast in those days. Matthew chapter 6. When you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you don't appear to men to be fasting. But to your heavenly Father, your heavenly Father who sees what you do in secret will reward you openly. He didn't say if you fast, when you feel like it. He says when you fast. Christ expects his disciples to fast and pray and seek his face. If we want to see revival in our churches, in our communities, we need to live a lifestyle of praying and fasting. That's what moves the heart of God when we're humble before him and saying, Lord, I'm willing to give up food to cry out for your presence and the power released in our services. 
A lot of people are believing God to restore prayer in the schools. I'm believing God to restore prayer in the church. Forget about the schools. The churches are not praying. Christians are not praying. Forget about the schools. We need prayer in the church. People interceding. People seeking God. People excited for the things of God. People that are willing to pray and say, Lord, I will not let you go until you bless me. And fasting does that. It breaks the power of the devil. And that's why we live, we have a lot of Christians, unfortunately, living below their privileges. And that always breaks my heart. God has all these promises in the word to overcome sin, resist the devil, push back temptation, live a victorious life, but they never enter into that fullness of what God has for them because they allow their flesh to dominate their life. Not so much the devil, their own sinful nature. How many know that we all have a sinful nature? Whether the pastor or the youngest person, we all have a sinful nature that needs to be in check through prayer and fasting and getting filled with the spirit of almighty God. That's why in Galatians chapter 5, starting at verse 16, Paul the apostle tells the Galatians, walk in the Holy Spirit. Translation, be filled, saturated, submerged in the Holy Spirit so that you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. And these two are in conflict with one another so that you don't do what you want. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. You have to be filled with the spirit of the living God. God has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. Peter denied Jesus three times, but he still forgave him. And he said, don't worry, Peter, there's going to become a time that you're going to get baptized with the Holy Spirit. And it's not going to be you anymore that's speaking. I'm going to take over your life. And he did on the day of Pentecost that when he preached his first sermon, fire came out of his mouth. And 3,000 people got saved and said, what must we do to be saved? Because when the anointing of the spirit of the living God is there, you don't have to argue with people. God converts the soul. It says in Psalm 19, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Only the word of God converts the soul by the spirit of the living God. And here are the Ninevites, believing God, trusting in God, humbling themselves before God. We don't want to perish. The same things the sailors said. To Jonah, when he was sleeping, he said, wake up and call upon your God. You don't know he might forgive us so that we don't perish. God's will is that none should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. And here they were, humbling themselves before God. Verse 10, when God saw, God sees everything. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. God's always first compassion, mercy, a chance over and over and over again. When he saw them humbling themselves, he says, I can't destroy. Look at it, broken. And he forgave them and had compassion on them. And the repentance was genuine. So that whole city got converted because Jesus confirms that in Matthew 12, 41. Listen to what he says. The people of Nineveh will stand up against this generation on judgment day and condemn it. For they repented of their sins at the preaching of Jonah. Now someone greater than Jonah is here, but you refuse to repent. Talking to the religious leaders. Jesus acknowledged that generation, the Ninevites, they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And these religious leaders did not want to repent. They believed uh, in Jonah's day and they repented. That whole generation. Later on, God destroys the Assyrians. You know, and, and later on, but this generation that believed what Jonah said repented and the whole city got converted. And now we're going to see Jonah's resentment. Starting at verse, chapter 4, verse 1. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. Could you imagine? Revival's happening. People are getting saved. You know, people that you have problems with, all of a sudden they get saved. They start coming to church and a Christian doesn't come back or doesn't like it. Their heart is not right. 
Jonah had a bad attitude from the beginning. He was displeased with what God did. He became angry, upset, resentful, even for going there in the beginning. Instead of rejoicing and saying, wow, look, I brought revival to this old city. He did not like the Ninevites. He hated them. They were the enemies of the Jews. And he who is angry. And then he prayed, verse 2, Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? This is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I know that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. In other words, Jonah had great theology, which means he knew his God, that he's compassionate, he's merciful. He knew God is a forgiving God. He says, look, this is what I said when I was back in home. I didn't want to come here in the beginning because this was what I was afraid of. The Ninevites might repent and turn to you. And he was not happy with that. He knew the character of God. In verse 3, he prays, Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Here is Jonah, did not get his own way, <coughs> pouting because God did not do what we, he wanted him to do, and we do that at times. God's ways are always higher than our ways. We're never going to understand the infinitude of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. His ways are higher than our ways. All we can do is trust Almighty God. But here he is praying that God would take his life. It is better for me to die than to live. When he was in the belly of the fish, he was praying for God's salvation. Now he's praying for God to take his life. See the difference? When he was stuck in a situation that he didn't like, he prayed to the Lord to get him out of there. But now he's saying, God, kill me. I don't want to live anymore. In other words, this prophet was selfish. He was self-centered. You know, he wanted to do his own thing. And then the Lord replies to him, do you have a right to be angry? Do you have a right to be angry, Jonah? Jonah does not answer. And a lot of times God asks us that question. Because God saves whoever he wants. God has mercy with whoever he wants. Right? God loves all people, even the Muslim, Islam, whatever. All people God loves. And that's why we need to get filled with the Spirit of God so that we can exhibit the love of God to all people. And we got to check our hearts that there is no racism in our hearts or prejudice in our hearts, that we will witness only to a certain type of people. God loves all people. And here is this prophet revealing his true condition in his heart. He was prejudiced. He was a racist. He was full of anger. You know, he wanted to die. He tried to manipulate God. He said, this is why I want to come here in the first place pouting because he didn't get his own way. He asked him, do you have a right to be angry? In verse 5, he doesn't answer God. Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in the shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. He was still inquisitive. He said, I don't believe this. I'm going to sit right out here, and I'm going to just watch the city be destroyed. I'm going to watch God destroy the Assyrians. He wanted to check it out. He still didn't believe it. He still thought that God was going to do what he wanted to do. Could you imagine still going home and saying, look, a great revival took place. The Assyrians repented. When I preached them, they all started fasting. They didn't even give dog food out. It was powerful. No. Here he is standing outside the city just watching it, hoping that God would destroy it. That reveals what's in his heart. How many know that problems reveal what's in a person's heart? Their character comes out when the pressure's on. When the blessings are going on, everybody's a Christian. But when God puts pressure and allows you to go through the fire, what's inside comes out. And a lot of times it's nasty and ugly that we don't like. But God does that so that we would deal with it. And here is this prophet full, full of anger, bitter, resentful, I don't want to go. But throughout all this, we see the sovereignty and the mercy and the love of God. Still dealing with Jonah. He could have used another prophet, but he still deals with us. And some of us that have been saved for a long time, I say this all the time, we should be loving God more than any new believer. You know why? Because God has put up with our nonsense longer than anybody else. 
So you should be the first one worshiping and raising your hand. If you've been saved 20 years. That's 20 years God has put up with our nonsense and our, our, our disobedience and, and, and our flesh and all that. And he keeps dealing with us and loving us and calling us back. If you drifted and backslid and God has sent people your way to draw you back the mercy and the love of God. So you cannot allow, if you've been saved for many, many years, a new believer to outpraise you. Because God has dealt with you as a father for many, many years. I love him today more than I did when I first got saved. I didn't know him. I didn't know that when I messed up, he said, don't worry, son, come this way. And pray a little bit fast, and I'll break that out of your life. I didn't know that, but as you get intimate with God and walk with him day by day, you learn the character of God is mercy. And my standing with him is not based on what I do, but who I am as a child of God. We love him because he first loved us. So I don't want to see an old believer that's been saved being outpraised by a new person who just got saved. That should never be. Because you should be so deeply in love with God that when everybody gave up on you, God said, I have a plan for your life. Even though you fall seven times, I'm going to pick you back up. We're moving forward with my power and with my grace. How many people have been saved for a while? Praise the Lord and worship God. Express your gratitude towards God. And I always tell people, look, if God would not have saved me, I would have been dead or in jail. That is the statistics in the city where I grew up. There's no other way. You get sucked into that lifestyle whether you want to or not. The sin is so powerful and the demonic influences in the city that if Christ had not rescued me, I would have been dead or in jail. Hanging out with the wrong people, being in clubs and shootouts going on that I had to run. The grace of God was over me even when I wasn't looking for him. Nothing compares to the love of God. No one will ever love you the way God loves you. Right? Our spouses get tired of us. They get annoyed. Our children. But God deals with us over and over and over and over and over again. And now he gives Jonah an object lesson. In verse 6, Then the Lord God provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. Notice that phrase, God provided. In chapter 2, it says that God provided a great fish. We see God's provision. This phrase is mentioned four times. God's still working on behalf of Jonah, even though he don't deserve it. You know what that's called? Grace. Undeserved favor. Getting something that you don't deserve. And here, Jonah, God provides a plant. And now, Jonah's sitting under the shade and relaxing. And the Bible says, and Jonah was very happy about the vine. Now notice that Jonah is back and forth. He's emotionally unstable. One minute he's angry, and now he's happy. But the Bible says that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let not that person think that they'll receive anything from the Lord. So here Jonah, he's angry one minute. God provides shell. Okay, now I'm happy. And then it says in verse 7, but at dawn the next day, God provided a worm. All these are miracles that God is working on behalf of Jonah to teach him a lesson. God provided a worm which chewed the vine so that it withered. Verse 8, when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind. So could you imagine 120 degrees that hot? And the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. Wait a minute, wasn't Jonah just happy the day before? Notice how he keeps moving back and forth as an emotional response to what God is doing in his life. That's why whenever you have strong emotions or you're angry or you, or you feel a certain way, don't make any major decisions out of anger or frustration. Stay put until God begins to heal you and things clear up. You see Jonah, he's happy, he's angry, he's angry again, he's happy. Back and forth. An emotional prophet that unless he doesn't get his way, he's not going to be happy. He prayed again, I'd rather die. But God said to Jonah in verse 9, Do you have a right to be angry about the vine? The same question, I do, he said. I am angry enough to die. This prophet being suicidal. 
Could you imagine? Some people could be so self-centered that if they don't get their own way, they'd rather die than see God moving in their lives, than see people getting saved, than seeing revival. They only think about me, myself, and I. This was Jonah. I have a right to be angry. I'd rather die, God, because you didn't do what I wanted you to do. And God's love and mercy, he still puts up with all that nonsense. Because God understands the human nature. People don't understand that. How many know that we're humans? We cry, we get hurt, we get offended, we get lonely at times. That's the human nature that God understands. Pastors and evangelists and Christians are not superhumans. We all bleed blood. But what keeps us is the grace and the mercy of God. And that's the aspect that God deals with. That's why he gives second and third and fourth and fifth chances. Because when everybody else abandons you, he sees your heart. And he says, I'm willing to work with you. Nobody sees what I see, but I'm going to work with you. I'm going to turn you into a powerful man and woman of God. I'm going to allow my spirit to flow through you. I'm going to use you to impact other people's lives. Don't allow your past to dictate what God wants to do in your life. Don't live in the past. Don't allow Satan to use your past and say, God can't use you. You've been through too much. You've failed the Lord so many times. You are a hypocrite. The devil speaks to your mind. How many know that? He's a liar and the father lies. And he knows the word more than many of us. And that's why when Jesus was getting tempted for 40 days and 40 nights in Matthew chapter uh, 4, the devil came to him and says, Turn these stones and make them into bread. Jesus said, It's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. You know what Satan says? Okay, this guy knows scripture. Let's... Try it now with scripture. I also know scripture too. Jesus, look at what the Bible says. Throw yourself down from here. And the Bible says in Psalm 91 that he will give his angels charge over you so that you won't dash your foot against a stone. The devil quoting scripture on Jesus? Does he know the Bible? Sometimes better than most of us? It's a shame. He knows the scriptures. Using it to his advantage. But Jesus knew the scriptures in the right way. He said, yes, but it's also written, you shall not test the Lord your God. In other words, there's not a show for me to jump down to see if it happens. So with people that don't know the scriptures, Satan defeats them with their own flesh, with their own sinful nature. People that are grown in the Lord and that know the word of God, the next step he does is twist the scriptures. And confuse you with their own scriptures. Just like he tried to do to Jesus. So he knew Psalm 91 and he knows more than Psalm 91. And then God tells him, but the Lord said to Jonah, you have been concerned about this vine. That you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell the right hand from their left. Now that's talking about children who can't tell they're right here from their left. So history says that there was about 6,000 people there. And many carried us well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? In other words, Jonah, you cared about this plant that you didn't even work for. And shouldn't I care about human beings? How many know that humans are more important than plants? Are more important than animals? Human beings, they're valuable. That's why Jesus said, what would a man give in exchange for his soul? Nothing you shouldn't get for exchange for your soul. What good is it if a man gains the whole world and loses his soul? A soul is so valuable in the eyes of God that it caused innocent blood to be shed. Amen. That's how much a person Amen. costs to God. Amen. That innocent blood had to be shed. So God closes this book with a question. Should I not be concerned about that great city? And we should be concerned about our city and the people around us, we should never have the attitude of Jonah. Jonah is a bad example. And that's why if you read Hebrews chapter 11, Faith's Hall of Fame, Jonah doesn't show up there. He was a terrible witness. Who's going to put him in there? But guess who showed up in there? Rahab the prostitute. And she's always mentioned like that, Rahab the prostitute. Because when Moses sent the spies to go spy out Jericho, I mean Joshua, yeah, Moses, he sent Joshua to spy it out. Rahab the prostitute saw them and grabbed them real quick and hid them. And they came to get them and she said, no, they're not here. And then she said, I know everything that God has done for you, how he opened the Red Sea, 
The fear of you is all over this place. Listen, when you come and take this land, please remember me and my family. They say, okay, if you keep your word, we will keep ours. When we come to destroy the city, Rahab, I know you have a bad reputation, you've done things wrong and all that, but because of your faith in God, we're going to save you. When we come in the city through a purple uh, scarlet robe out your window so that we can know that's your house, and when we come in the city, you and your whole family is going to be saved. And then she shows up in the Faith's Hall of Fame, Hebrews chapter 11. Why? Because it doesn't matter your past. It's your faith in Almighty God. For the righteous shall live by faith. So Jesus is greater than Jonah. How is he greater than Jonah? Jonah's ministry was but to one city. But Jesus is the Savior of the world. Jonah's obedience was not from the heart, but Jesus always did whatever pleased his heavenly father. Jonah didn't love the people he came to save, but Jesus had compassion for sinners and proved his love by dying for them on the cross. Remember that? As they crucify him, Jesus looking down at what he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. His own enemies crucify him, and he's still praying for the Lord. They don't, they're blinded by the devil. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Have mercy upon them, Lord. And on the cross, outside of the city, Jesus asked God to forgive those who killed him. But Jonah waited outside the city to see if God would kill those he would not forgive. The difference between Jonah and Jesus. Jesus was greater than Jonah. He came to die for our sins. And he used Jonah as an illustration of his resurrection. He says, Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Talking about his resurrection. So Jesus spoke about the story of Jonah as a historical reality, not a figment of people's imagination or a story that happened. It was a real event that took place. Why don't we stand as we get ready to close? And if you're watching online, I encourage you, it doesn't matter how many times you've messed up, God is a God of second chance and third chance and fourth chance. All you got to do is turn your life over to God, ask him to forgive you, and move on with God and he will forgive you. Just say, Jesus, come into my heart, forgive me for my sins, I, I'm sorry for everything I've done, Lord, and I want to start fresh. And God will give you a second chance, no matter how bad you've messed up, God still loves you and he has a plan for your life. Amen?